Oh, yeah. 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 And so what do they look like otherwise? Uh, underground, like a huge grub looking thing. Oh. Yeah. You don't even see them. They go down pretty deep. I don't even know what they eat. They don't really cause issues. You'll see holes in the ground coming out. This is where they're, they're coming out of the ground, and that's kind of... Welcome to today's garden class. We are talking about evergreens, what should grow in the yard, but I wanted to introduce my little friend Gilbert here. These are the uh, cicadas for you folks online. Can you take a look at them? Oh, how close can I get to that, Ken? Is that yeah, too good. close? No, that's is that pretty good? His cicadas, so this is the guy that's making all that noise up in the trees. Uh, they, they live in the ground their entire lives and they come back and they just live for just a few weeks while they're basically making whoopee laying more eggs, and then those will drop here at the end of summer, and they'll drop to the ground, the larva, and they'll live their entire lives underground, but you'll see some holes in the ground about the size, about a half inch round, maybe an inch round. That's where they're coming out. Then you'll see a brown exoskeleton many times attach themselves to the side of your house, a barn, trees. That's the exoskeleton. This is what comes out of that larva, uh, and then just starts, this one's really tired, and so you don't have to freak out. They, if you look at them, they don't even have a mouth part. So, but they make that little noise. Let's see if we can get them to talk to me. Oh, come on. Talk to me. Okay, that's enough. Okay, we'll let him go. There we go. Fly away. Oh, he is flying away. Hey, that's good. He was more alive than I thought. So my name's Ken Lane. I'm the owner of the Garden Center. So I'm the second generation owner. So uh, I married... A water. So Harold Waters had four daughters. I married the youngest, prettiest. We had four kids. Uh, three of them decided to launch and go off. This town's not big enough for me. They went off and did their own thing. So a lot of them are Texans right now. So got a boy in the army. He's a captain. Uh, I've got a, a two daughters that live in Austin, Texas. Uh, one of them is married. One of them's not. And then I've got a daughter that works here. She's she's training to be the next generation, the third generation to our garden center owners. We've been around, this is our 60th year in business this year. So we started in 1962. We started before that, but the garden center piece of it actually started in 1962. Before that, the rumor is, and Harold's told me this, my father-in-law, I started with a borrowed shovel and, the, and the, uh, uh, the station wagon, and I started landscaping stuff, and it just kind of morphed into that. So that's kind of our family history. So today, garden centers, we're shifting over right now. So you're getting, we're, we've got a monsoon sale going. We're clearing out all the spring and summer stuff. It's got to go. Uh, all the spring blooming, the crab apples, the red buds, they all got to go. And we have all this new stuff coming in. It's all the evergreens. It's the fall colored. So it's maples and like we had a burning bush show up this week. I'll show you some of the new things that are coming in to replace those. The inventory won't go down. It'll just change to more of the fall and winter mix. And so that you're seeing that transition all over northern Arizona. Not so much the deserts. Deserts are kind of the same, hot all the time. Here, we're not so much. So we're gearing up for the evergreen stuff. Uh, what the designers say is, if you take a landscape course, they say 20% of your yard should be dedicated to evergreen foliage in the yard. I think that's a little light here. I think you ought to, because of our our rock lawns and things. I almost think it ought to be more like 25, 30%. It's just so cheated a little bit more. 
25% uh, should 20% should be spring, 20% should be summer blooming, uh, like uh, Rosa Sharon's crepe myrtles are blooming right now. 20% should be fall color. That's maples and all that pretty, you know, Virginia creepers, that bright color of fall. And then 20% should be uh, skewed towards evergreens. And that last 20% is just whatever tickles your fancy. Just do that. And I think some of that should be put towards more evergreen stuff. And evergreens, people think of them mainly as trees. I'm going to focus more on the shrub piece because it's more, it's harder to figure out the shrub piece. So I'd share some, some more of that with you just so you're kind of honed in. Uh, I wanted to brag a little bit on two things. One, last week we received a reward of the best garden center in, we have, I have a closet full of these. Ooh, almost broken, that would be bad. I haven't even showed it to the team yet. You're the first one to see it. So uh, this is the uh, Reader's Choice uh, Best Garden Center for 2022. Thank you very much, you folks online. Hit the like button in the comment field. It helps us with Google, really, it does. Help us out, will you? Make a comment, uh, subscribe. Anyway, we got that. That's my team, puts this together. And then you all voted for us. So the community kind of voted for us. So that's, and then I wanted to really brag her out because I'm talking to gardeners, right? I'm a gardener, you're a gardener. Let me show you some stuff. I picked this yesterday. Oh, wow. oh, 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 oh. oh my gosh, it's Brandy, brandy wine, basically. So I've got two of them and I've got, a, I've got a refrigerator full of them, basically. So I thought I would give this one to Ken. Ken, do, I don't even know if you like tomatoes. Oh, do you? Gonna Here, I'm going <laughs> to. There you go. That's for you. And then uh, who's new to the area? Brand new. This. How, how long have you been here? Almost a year. Anyone got her beat? Ooh, that's pretty good. Welcome to God's country. Both of you. Anyone, anyone else can beat six months? I'm going to give my other tomato, all organic, to you. You may have that. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Thanks for coming to a class. Yep. Uh, they are delicious. They're, they're delicious. Is yeah. that an heirloom tomato? That's an heirloom tomato. Yeah. Yep. I grow heirlooms and I grow uh, uh, hybrids, basically. Um, I think next year I'm going to grow more hybrids because I'm getting some leaf curl with all the rains that we've had. I'm starting to get some spotting issues, some, some foliage damage, which heirlooms are notorious. They want to die. They're just looking to die. And on dry years, it's okay. Wet years, I'm having, I'm, I'm struggling to keep them going. They're producing. They're big plants. Now they're starting to get off color just because of all the moisture. So my hybrids, no problem. They're not getting that. So I think that's a thing that I'm going to do. Every year you, you have a, a checklist. Oh, don't do this, do this. That's my checklist for my garden is what I'm going to do. Of course, next year, you know what it'll be. Drought, yeah, nothing. We won't see rain after from, from December on. So you just never know here. So it is a moist year. This is the kind of moisture I remember as a kid growing up here in the 70s and 80s. That this was every afternoon was a rainstorm. You couldn't go to church without closing the windows because by the time you got back, the rains were coming, the windows were open, and, and it was it was wet inside. So you just had to kind of always be ready for moisture. Last night I did leave the uh I left the windows down in the car. <laughs> yep. The electric, uh, the windows won't go up and down now, so they short it out. So I'm hoping they dry out because they'll start going up. But right now, I'm parked over there. Hopefully, I can get home before, cover it before it rains again. And I have this perpetual uh, windows won't go up and down. Isn't that frustrating? Anyway, that's the rains. I'll take it all day long. Your plants are doing exceptionally well. Uh, some advice I can give you right now, especially folks that are in that forested areas. You've got pinion pines, ponderosas, some of the junipers. Really, really pamper those. This is your opportunity. You don't get this kind of year every year. So if you take a 500-year-old tree, you see all the tree rings? Some of them are really tiny, um, and they've had a stressed-out year. You actually, I saw one yesterday. You could actually see the burn ring. You could see there was a fire that went through. You could see the char. And it grew after it, and then it's like this was a tree that was substantially old. It had gotten a fire going through that forest, like a hundred years in. You could see that, and then it just grew past it. But some of the rings are really fat and chubby. This is a fat, chubby year. This is a year when you can get it to really bump up and cover a, a multitude of damage from from bark beetles and ips beetles and flathead borers, all the things that eat on trees, which when they're stressed, they can kill them. 
and we've seen that for the last few years. This is your chance to get them back to health. The best advice I can give you right now for your evergreens, especially, especially your natives that have been there for a lot of years, um, fertilize them. Put the all-purpose plant food, I think I brought some of that. Put some of this on there, just sprinkle, it doesn't even matter how much, just sprinkle salt and pepper underneath the drip line. Don't focus on the trunk, focus out there. And then what you'll do is it'll, it'll pick the stuff up, it'll bump up that wood ring, it'll make it chubbier, it'll cover that. It'll, the uh, bark beetles, they tend to bore underneath the bark and, um, and they basically girdle the tree. This will allow it to grow over that and repair, repair the damage. So that's the best advice I can give you right now, just, to, just like right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it is. So she's got some pines that have some, some, some uh, oozing sap. That is never good on any kind of tree, but especially your conifers, your evergreens. That is bark beetle. And the plant is trying to flush that beetle out, trying to suffocate it basically. So it's been a pin, there's a there's a hole in the bark where that's coming out, and the tree is literally trying to flush, trying to drown that that bug out. It can be successful if it's valuable to you. I would take care of it. Uh, I would I would actually spray. I would give it just for you because again we're talking evergreens. How do you care for evergreens better? Um, there's a drench. I would give it some. I would fertilize it. It's called tree and shrub drench. It's not very original, but you mix it up in a watering can. You pour it right at the base of the tree, right at the trunk, right there where the crown meets the soil and the plant. There you go. I'll let the folks online. I forget. I know you're there. I just forget how far away the, the screen is. They got it? There you go. <laughs> Make sure the camera doesn't look up my nose or something weird. Um, anyway, this is, this is what I would do now. And this will, the plant will actually absorb this underneath the bark. And it'll go up through the through under the trunk and it will kill the bugs. It'll help the tree to keep them keep keep them in check. And this one application lasts for a year. So you should be set. This should do it for you till next year for a whole year. Yeah. Yeah. So that would do that for pines. Really, pines are, are have been at tremendous risk. We see some of it on the spruce. We've seen some damage on just about every evergreen conifer, the needled type of, of trees. You can see that potential damage. But now's your chance to really get it back into health. The other one to watch is while we're talking tree, just plants in general, you should see your plants actively growing. We're talking brand new foliage, brand new needles, brand, you should see brand new. If you don't see that, you've got problems. You, you're not, that's not normal. Your plant is stressed out, not, unlike your neighbors. Mine are all in full, glorious growing because I fertilized them right before the rains came in the first part of July. So now they've had like three, four, five weeks of growing and you're seeing this come up. If you don't have that, you need to fertilize. If your maples are off color, they should be rich green. If you're seeing yellowing, that's not good. You need to help that plant that you've an opportunity to really take advantage of that. So the clients I'm talking to this week, Fertilize it with the all-purpose, and then add to those stressed-out trees, humic. Humic is, this is humic acid, is what this is. For your organic gardeners, if you take a, a compost pile and you just boil it down, not boil it, but have it compost down to its last elements, it's humic acid. That's what this is. What humic acid does in the garden is, it, you, you put it where the roots are of the tree, it actually feeds the soil. So now the worms want to be there, the mycorrhizal colony, all the beneficial things that really grow and, and interact. There's a symbiotic thing in the soil that happens with these things, with the trees. It'll actually force new roots onto that tree. So you got larger roots, actually lowers a pH, so it'll green up the, the tree faster, and then it'll make your fertilizer go better. So I do both uh, at the same time. Not, I don't think you need this for everything. But some of you, obviously, I go through a neighborhood, I'm going, I, just, I could drive at 50 miles an hour. I wouldn't do that in your neighborhood, but I could. I could probably jet through it and go, problem, 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 problem. And you could just tell who's got, they just moved in. The previous owner couldn't take care of the property for the last 10 years, and now they're trying to catch up. You can just tell those properties there. And so these are things you can do that are easy solutions, but take advantage of the rain. So and I think that's about all I've got. 
Oh, another one I went on on the radio show this, this week today. Um, everything should be in bloom for you. If it's not blooming, if you don't have tomatoes the size of your head, you just fertilize, you keep it going. Make sure it's, you can, you can really get things to rebloom. What I'm doing for my gardens, uh, like zinnias, geraniums, marigolds, uh, I'm deadheading the spent flowers, roses. Just pinch off the dead flowers, just cut them back, fertilize them. What I'm doing is I'm taking my, my flower power. This is a water soluble. This is for little plants, not for trees. This is for containers and house plants and raised beds. This is for, so I mix this up in my watering can and I just water, I deadhead and I give it some of this and within two weeks, maybe less, maybe 10 days, full blown, just like that, just, just instantly. Cause it's so happy with the humidity I can just feel that I feel gooey just sitting here talking to you. You can just feel the humidity that we're not used to. Plants feed off that. They love that. But you can you can do that too. It should be in full bloom. And we'll go over some things that are that are in bloom. So I broke down some plants for you. I've got three handouts. The three handouts are the top ten list top 10 plant lists, and two of these are the top 10 shrubs and the top 10 trees that are evergreen. They aren't everything, but it's the top, it's the most popular. Those are the ones that are on the list. I'm gonna send that to you, okay? So, but for now, I'm gonna give this to the person that was here the second longest, that's for you. There you go. The other one is uh, pinyon pine scale. If you, who's got pinyon pines in their yard? I already gave you a tomato. Anyone else? Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Again, the, the rest of you will have a, a link to the PDF. So you can print it out on any device. You can read it on an iPad, laptop, whatever. We made it easy to read. So I'll, I'll send that link to you here shortly. The other one is how to plant. We're going to go over how do you plant a new evergreen. This is critical for evergreens. Evergreens are more sensitive to wet, soggy soil than any other plant. You really got to nail it. And so I, we, need to, we need to cover that or you'll have more death and decay than growth and life. So, but this is the how to plant kind of stuff. Who wants this one? Back row. Okay, then. Sorry. You've got to, you brought your dog. I love dogs. Again, again all of you are going to have this. Just kind of put your email down. Here you go. And I'll send it to you later today. Just, it'd be a real short, just three links. There you go. Print them at your leisure. If you don't want it, hit delete. So, or don't put your email down. If you're part of the garden club already, this is not going out to the entire garden club. It's only going to you all. Just, just this, just the class and you folks online. We know you're there. We're not going to forget you. Look inside the, uh, the comment column. The links are right there. You can print them out on your own. Okay. There you go. So, I broke it down into um, shade, kind of east coast. A lot of folks from that Midwest east coast, they want that look. I've got that broken down for you. That's boxwoods, that kind of stuff. Then I got the hardcore native local. I want things that are pokey, spiky, that bite me when I walk through the yard. I got that too. Okay, so we, I, I'll broke down all those. We'll explain. Then I got a few things that are, we'll make it sort of a game. Is it evergreen or is it not? Because some of them look evergreen, but they really aren't. But we'll try to play with that. And there's no right or wrong answer. I'm not going to embarrass you. You'll be fine. Why don't we start down with shh, shh. Let's go with native stuff. Start with that, shall we? That's yuccas and agaves, that kind of stuff. So number one seller is this one and this one. These guys are, are cousins. This is the traditional. This is red yucca. It's in full bloom right now. Gets up, red yucca standard, gets up just below hip high with spike with flowers floating up about right here or so. Very strong grower. It is true evergreen. Be careful. I brought this one mainly as a lesson for you all. If you have gardeners, a novice gardener will treat this like a grass. And next winter and, fall and spring, they'll whack it off like a grass and have it come back fresh from the bottom. These don't recover from that. It would take years. Don't let them prune this foliage off. They could take this stem off, just take it back, trim it off, and that's all you do. Very low care. This one I plant in my garden. I'll put it on a drip system for about a year. 
I get it rooted, and then I thinned back that irrigation, and I've, you'd never water it again. It just goes by itself. It's truly, truly a very, very draw hardy uh, gig. Uh, this thing, sometimes I'll put bean, little bean uh, uh, modules on it. You can pick those off. I've actually taken them. If they're by the front door, you can have fun with it in the holidays. You can spray paint them red. You can have all kinds of fun with them. Uh, but you're going to prune this off in winter. So just enjoy it. Don't worry about it. It should send off several. If you fertilize this every once in a while, you'll get more, fl more flower stalks coming up. So it's a good one. This is too big for a lot of plants, like closer to the uh, patio. Um, in containers, it's too big. So we have a dwarf variety. This is called brake light. And you see the color. This is traditional kind of salmon red. It's a true, true like brake light red. It's a true red. And this is as tall as it gets. And the flowers hover above this. So it's pint size. So now you've got more versatility. It's just as hardy as this one, but it's it's dwarf variety. So we're trying to introduce more and more yuccas. Yeah, all these, so javelina, so the question was, are they javelina, deer, pack rat, voles, porcupine, antelope anymore, uh, elk are starting to show up on the backside of Copper Basin, uh, Kirkland, Skull Valley. So we live in the forest. We're surrounded by forests. We are in that wildland interface, no matter where you're at. Those are both... Everything but gophers. Gophers love yuccas. So I would say that's the one they watch. If you have gophers, that's an underground rat. You should kill them. They deserve to die. And they don't live in your yard. They need to go away and live at your enemy's house or something. <laughs> Throw them over the fence at Home Depot. That, that'd do me a favor, okay? That'd be great. Um, this is a wild yucca. This is a big yucca. You'll see these in the forest. It's got this curly Q thing around it. Gets pretty substantial. It's pretty big, and it puts on a white flower about this tall. So it's very, very hardy, very much a native. Um, this is another big, this is blue-beaked yucca. Uh, bear grass is another, uh, uh, javelina proof, javelina proof, deer proof. I had another one out in the prairies. This is Paulden. Oh, I don't want to get poked. This is bear grass. This is the grass that's growing out in the, in the, out in the fields out there, uh, Prescott Valley, Dewey, Humboldt. This is the grass. Does really, really well. Gets a white flower on it in summer, late summer through fall. Some years, not every year, but seems to be a pretty strong grower. Again, it's a grass, but it's an evergreen grass. You don't cut it back like a pampas grass or a deer grass or something other. You leave this the way it is. You'd cut off that flower like you would a yucca and then leave the rest of it intact. Again, nothing eats this. Wear gloves because it's got razor blade. Like uh, you can cut yourself on this one, so kind of be careful. All right, that's the yucca stuff. Uh, oh, I guess not. I got this one. Gold sword. You just have that dark colored rock out there. Sometimes you put more of these darker blues. They don't show up as well. Sometimes I use the bright colors. Uh, I use this one. I use uh, this quite a bit. I love gold juniper. Hardy, you can't kill it. It's consistent, methodical, and if you've got a real dark yard, I've got a north-facing slope with dark ground cover. It's dark back there, and if I put a blue back, now we just wouldn't see it as much. These bright colors, it almost glows at night. It does glow at night. It's very, very pretty, so very tough. Junipers do really well, so I'll use these. This has a white flower to it. Gets up about, I don't know, three, four feet. Very, very pretty yucca. Again, nothing really eats this. Some, I have seen a deer eat it once, but that was drought season. Drought was kind of weird. Now that they have the stuff they normally like to eat, I don't. I think the pressure is going to be off of us. It'll be more normal, uh, kind of like all bets were off before. They definitely don't eat this. This gets up. I've got some very mature ones, probably, oh, knee high. But as wide as you and I, if, you, if it's really happy and mature, I would say six feet would be very realistic. Six, okay six by to, three. Is it okay to cut them back? Oh, yeah. Okay, give it a haircut. Yeah, but junipers like to be cut. They like to get fuller and chubbier. And they glow more. They, they like to be touched and nurtured and 
fertilize. They just like all that gardener touching them. They like that. Um, native, let's go down this path. This is this is agave. We've got several agaves back there. It's also called century plant. The myth is once every 100 years, it blooms. puts on this really tall stalk. grows about 12, 15 feet tall. Uh, you can almost watch it grow by the day. It's, it's quite impressive. Actually, if it's in your landscape and cared for at all, it'll bloom every 10, 15 years. It blooms much more often. It'll get about this big, kind of ball-shaped, also, also called agave, uh, um, uh, artichoke agave. Has kind of this real pretty artichoke look to it. Um, don't put this where the grandkids are going to run into it because it is it will skewer your leg. So put it out there a ways. So I've got it across the dry wash where they don't play as much. Uh, I wouldn't put this by the pond. It looks really pretty in a container. It's kind of quite quite, quite striking. Um, when it blooms, the mother plant will die. And then pups will generally come up. The way it naturally grows, this grows wild out, out in the forest. It'll grow up. It falls over. All those seeds that were up there kind of go 15 feet out. Now they start coming up over there. It's the way that nature has developed this plant to spread across, a, a let's say, a hilltop. Uh, and then the pups come out from, from underneath. So you'll see that natively grow like that in the wild as well. Cacti, we don't grow a lot of cactus. That's the first thing someone from the Midwest says, I want to look, I want a swarrow. Can you get me one? I go, yeah, I can. You sure you want to spend that kind of money for a plant that's going to die in three months? What? They don't grow up here. They freeze out in the winter. Same with citrus, same with uh, 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 avocados. There's certain things they just don't grow up here. They'll grow during the summer. They don't grow during the winter. Winter kills them out. Um, these, we do grow several varieties of prickly pear. They all do really well. Not all of them. There's some that are desert varieties that won't, that die out in the winter up here. These are the ones that you've, if you're buying cacti at Waters Garden Center, ours are going to live. Oh, man. Of course, they're at maximum weight because it's been raining so much. So that's one. This is another. I just brought two to show you. They're both prickly pear. But can you see the difference? This is um, purple uh, prickly pear punteus, and this is the traditional taller one gets yellow flowers to it you can prick, pick the fruits on it this one that pick this is one that actually puts the fruits on kind of fun again put this out where the um where that century plant is away because it wants to bite you it just wants to kind of reach out and give you some love so you can they don't really need a lot of pruning what they'll do is they'll spread they'll kind of mound like this you kind of want to pinch them, you kind of want to keep them back out of the walkway or back, kind of keep them back so you can take off these pads. Usually you'll just take a pair of scissors or just snip off that pad. You can take that pad and plant it in the ground and it will grow over there. Or what, what I do is I just throw them away because I can't deal with that many cacti. I just don't need that much. So I'll, I'll, I'll take advantage of them until I've got too many and then I go, okay, that's enough. This is one I've had fun with. Well, let's do this one because it's another native. This is clear cup or uh, hedgehog. You'll see this growing up out of the rocks and stuff. That's this one. Um, this one's so happy with the rain. You see, see it's so chubby, it's starting to push. It's gonna break the pot. It just is growing like crazy. So it gets a real, little pink flower to it. This is as tall as it gets. This is very happy. Then it spreads, kind of spreads out like this. So you can plant these yourself. The way you plant these, I'll dig the hole. I'm not gonna go over how to plant yet, but just how do you handle this? Usually I'll dig my hole out, I'll get everything ready. I'll lay it down the side and I'll cut the bucket off and I pick it up by the roots and I'll gently lay it down in there, backfill it that way. The prickly pears, you can use um, newspapers, thick gloves, things to kind of keep the needles from coming out and getting you. But if it's a bigger one, cut the bucket off and just set it down in there. Ah. This is a new one we found. This is. Um, Moroccan mound. I've got one that's probably this big around. It's in a red pot. It's been in there for years and years and years. Uh, I like cacti. I like playing with them. This is a zone eight. We're a zone seven B. So it's borderline, especially up, I'm just above the high school overlooking uh, Prescott Lakes, that area, the, the Dells area. It gets kind of cold up there. I'm just where the frost, we're, when a storm hits us, the snow hits my house and like 
just down the hill doesn't. It's right there. Uh, I would think this would do great out in Prescott Valley, uh, down towards Kirkland, out towards Humboldt. Uh, Paulden's kind of a weird one because you get all that cold air spilling out off of Ash Fork right on top of you all. Paulden's got the most extreme of, of all the gardening experience. But this one I put in a pot and in the winter, I just move it next to the house. The house gets, puts off enough insulation where it just thrives, does really well. I think this one's gonna bust my pot this year. It's so full, you can just tell it's pushing at the seams. So Mediterranean mound, and those are basically the cacti. Oh, I guess uh, um, uh, uh, choya or jumping cactus. Those are interesting. They do want to bite you. They do come out and get you. So you want to put them out there where you're not going to be accidentally rubbing up against it. But there is a place for them. There's lots of funky, new, interesting varieties that are out there, and they're super tough. Um, uh, saguaro don't grow up here. Acatillo. There's rumors of them, but I've just stopped trying to sell them because they just die to the plant. I've, you come to us for plants for success. You're coming for better plants that really grow. Um, I got to deliver on that. Nocatillo just doesn't do it. That's that tall, spiky one. It gets up kind of vase shaped. It's evergreen. It gets that red flower to it. I would say you're really down at Cordis Junction Spring Valley before it really starts growing. You're seeing it down at that 4,000 foot level and lower. That's where you see it growing. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Like yeah. Do you have to break the pot in order to get it out? <laughs> so, um, her question was: So I've got I've got cacti that are growing in pots. They're ceramic pots, and now they're outgrowing their pots. Now, first of all, they've been in there for like ten years, so I've had many, 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 many years of enjoyment. Do I have to break the pot to get them out of there? No. Uh, usually at that point, the, the cacti needs to be divided. And so you'll just kind of take some cuttings, take some roots. You're kind of brutal to it. You're just digging it out of there. You're potting up two or three other ones, throwing away the rest of it because there's way too much, way too much. Or I'll send them off to the farm and grow out the extra, the extras. I'll have them back for sale in a couple of years. Um, usually I'll try to chip out the roots what's left. Uh, if it's a pot I want to keep. I have a lot of containers. Some of them get, they go out of fashion. They're kind of like an orange sofa in your living room. They just don't fit. They were great in the, you know, 30 years ago. Now, not so much. I'll just bust that one open going, that's enough. This is another one that, uh, this just came in yesterday. This grows wild out in the forest. You'll just see a, a, this blue-gray Moundy shrub. It's called gray leaf catoniaster or cotton easter. This one is bulletproof. This is one I would put out in the yard, plant it where you want it, and make sure it has drainage. We'll show you how to do that later. I would put it on irrigation for one year, and then I would just so I can root it out, just so I can get the roots from this to the outer area, and then I would cut, bend back that irrigation and let it go by itself. It's truly, truly a native evergreen plant. Animals don't eat this. They've trained, this plant has trained the animals to leave it alone. It's got a texture and a taste to it they don't like. They'll leave it alone. It's called gray leaf ketoniaster. It's about this tall, kind of ball shaped. Ketoniasters do really, really well here. I'll show you a couple of them here. Gray leaf, that's true native. It's growing in the same areas. I don't know why I put those cacti right in front of these, but usually those will be growing with these. This is uh, manzanita. Evergreen with that red bark to it. This one gets up, this is a dwarf variety, it gets up about this tall. We've got several, we, we kind of specialize in manzanitas. We've got ground cover varieties. We've got knee high, hip high, and the regular traditional big one. Um, I find the big one gets too big in, in a lot of gardens. It's kind of nice to have a little bit smaller one. Uh, but evergreen, it gets the same bell-shaped flower in the spring. It's actually a pollinator for bees early on because it blooms early. So your honeybees will be out foraging. There's nothing for them. This thing is blooming. They're just all over it. It's a real benefit to them. So man's need as well. Um, if you, we'll show you how to plant this. This one you want. This one wants to die. So if you plant it, you really got to make sure that soil drains. So keep that in mind when we start going over how to plant. You really want to go after this one well. 
keep it from drowning. Whew. The other one that's a native, two others. Can I get there? Native and acts like a native, cousin of a native. This is a silverberry or Ellie Agnes is the botanical name. Think Ellie and then Agnes, put them together. Silverberry. The native one, you'll see a shrub about as tall as I am, kind of kind of round shaped, growing out in the forest. Um, it usually has this gray, gray foliage to it, this blue gray look to it. It doesn't have the gold. We've bred this to have kind of more sex appeal, basically look a blonde rather than a brunette or whatever, uh, or blue net, whatever it is. Um, the gold seems to be, shines up better, but true, true, true evergreen. No animals bother this. Again, get it established, cut it off of all care. Usually this one, because I'm putting it where I want it to get taller, and so get up about as tall as you and I and equally as wide, gets pretty substantial. Um, I'll put it on the irrigation until it gets up to size, then I cut it back for, from, from further care. I think this is a better choice than red-tipped photinia, which is the better seller. So more people want that because it grows fast. It's almost a weed, so it's, you can get more plant for the money, the red-tipped photinia, but I'm going to make more money off of you in the long run because it's going to get mildew and deer are going to eat it. Things are going to happen. If they're short-lived, there's a lot of problems with them, but they're cheap up front. They're just hard to maintain down on the back row. Heavy maintenance to prune them. Just, there's just a lot of work. These are no care. You're never going to have a bug on it. Animals are never going to bother it. This is the one I plant in my own yard, silverberry. Okay, It's got a flower on it. Uh, it's not, rather, you don't see it, but you sure smell it. You'll smell the flower, very sweet, kind of almost sweeter than lilac, sweeter than jasmine kind of, kind of uh, flower to it. Great choice for evergreens. Put that there. This one, again, I would plant before I would plant red tip photinia. Let's show you red tip photinia is this. I got to get it out there because everyone's going to go, yeah, but what about red tip photinia? There you go. It's got it. I've sold thousands this year already. Plant it if you want. Gets up 12 by 12 by 12. It's too big for most gardens. Don't put this next to your house or you will curse it. And I wish I'd sure listened to that guy over at Waters, man. What's his name again? Some goofball name. Um, that's because it just grew too fast. Uh, if you love to prune on plants, this is a great one for you. If you like low maintenance, you'd like to rather go on cruises than cut your yard back, this one maybe isn't for you. It looks innocent, but it's going to be, all the new growth is red, and then it gets up. It just grows. It'll grow three or four feet a year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, deer, cow, everything eats on that, yeah. It gets a mildew right now. We're starting to have customers come in. The leaves are getting white, coated in white because of the rains. That one, that one's real prone to that. Gets aphids. If there's a disease in the neighborhood, that one's going to get it. Um, this one won't. Cows don't eat this one, personal experience. The gold one, they won't eat that. The, the uh, silver berry, they won't eat that. Yeah, yeah. They don't eat this for sure. Um, this is red clusterberry cotoneaster, cotton easter, cotoneaster. It's related to that gray one I showed you earlier. It's related to this one. Only this one gets big. Gets at least eight feet, maybe 10 feet. It gets this big pretty easy. So uh, white flowers in the spring, very pretty. And then the clusters of white flowers turn into clusters of red berries, thus the name red clusterberry cotoneaster. Uh, I've, I've got down the foot on the farm in Skull Valley. I had this. We're using my my propane tank to heat the greenhouses and and my house. But this is a big tank, so it looked like a submarine in the yard. It was it was ugly. So I just planted two of these in front of it, and within a year, boom, it was disappeared. Didn't see it anymore. So I just kind of screened it all out, kind of overlapping pattern, made it go away. So it felt more garden esque instead of a farm hardware. Kind of where's the combine it's it's great when you're making money with it but it's ugly otherwise sitting out there in the yard that's kind of what propane tanks are it's a great plant for your you can make this perfectly square you could dr seuss it you can have it overlapping with uh, uh, uh screens you can make it topped yeah and the more you cut on it the thicker it gets so it likes to be cut on it's again this one likes gardeners it likes to be touched and 
cut back and fertilize and you know, it does better prunes uh, so this one's going to like at least six hours of sun or more it's going to like full sun there's some better choices i'll have for you in a second that are more shade loving sun 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 i brought this one i find it's a little bit better than red tip photinia this is privet you texans the southern folks seem to like this one a lot um, this one grows thick, goes eight feet by eight feet, gets, gets big. Um, they'll, they'll typically hedge it, so trim it, so, so screens, green walls, soften up the, the block wall kind of thing, the chain link. They're putting that in there to kind of soften that up. Um, gets a white flower to it, it's very fragrant. This is its color year round all the time. Um, and deer can eat on it a little bit, probably cows would eat on this. Cows, all bets are off. All you need is a couple of them to compete. You know, they're starting to eat. They have those two stomachs. They're eating before they figure out they don't like it. They've already eaten half of it, and then they move on kind of thing. So uh, I've never raised cows, but I've been in cow country and farmed. I've been where a lot of cows are. Um, this is mugo pine. Really good plant for here. It gets, gets up about this tall, kind of mound shaped like this. Uh, just a mounding shrub evergreen. It looks like a scotch pine only stays small. It's such a shrub form. Great little plant. I don't think it puts a pine cone on. Probably does. I just have never really seen it do that. Just a nice green. Looks innocent. But it'll get nice and chubby and full, kind of mounding. It's great against driveways, next to the patio. It's not, it's gonna get, not gonna take over and animals aren't gonna bother this. It's a good plant for your like pine trees. Okay, that's the nativey stuff. Let's transition over to more of the, the Midwest kind of thing. This is probably the number one selling evergreen tree, conifer. This is Alberta spruce. And the reason it's number one seller is it goes anywhere. It could be in containers. We use it uh, at the front door by those posts, just to soften the post on either side of the driveway, against the in pots, against the... the the garage door where you need something to soften things up. Uh, the reason it's so popular is you plant it and you'd never have to do anything to it. It's a very slow grower. If you've got really green thumbs, you might get three inches a year out of it. This is one you really want to probably spend a few more dollars on and buy the size you want because to get this up to this size, it's going to take forever. Just pay the extra money for the bigger one because that's the size you're going to, that's probably where you're going to be for, for years. Uh, lots of little miniature Christmas trees. We grew, we'll stock up for these for the holidays because every front door should have one with some decorative lights on it, some bows. It just it just screams holidays. But low care, goes in a raised bed, grows in containers, grows out in the yard. It's real flexible, and it doesn't get too big. Whereas, and that goes sun or shade. it's going to go in sun. It's actually pretty flexible. I've grown it in shade. It gets a little thin, though, a little wispy. Opens up some. It stays fuller and, and kind of like a teddy bear in the sun. So I would say I would say give it at least four hours of sun if you could. Although shade here in the mountains of Arizona, it's a bright shade. There's actually more sun that filters through than you think than would happen, let's say, with a, a thick canopy of trees or something. That being said, I know you folks up Copper Basin, you're, that's thick pine trees up there. Just depends on where you're at. So this one... Colorado spruce, Fat Albert, any, any kind of spruce, it's going to do really, really well. This is actually a tree. So this is Fat Albert spruce. It's a dwarfed Colorado. So Colorado spruce is the number one seller. Spruce Mountain, it, you could, it's just right up Senator Highway. It's right there. That's where your native Colorado spruce, they just grow up there. So you know they're going to adapt really well. Some of them are hundreds of years old here. They're big. I mean, 80-foot tree in your yard that's 25 feet wide, it's too big for a lot of yards. This is a Fat Albert spruce. It doesn't get that big. Gets up in that high teens, but with the perfect shape, that perfect Christmas tree-looking layered shape to it. So, And then, then it has this bluer new growth. It's, it's famous for its bluer its silver growth. So whereas Colorado spruce is more of a a light kind of a true blue instead of a silver blue. Again, you can see the different colors, but um, that's a little, this will get oh, 
10, 15 feet wide, something like that. Just that perfect little, perfect little shape that you want. 18 feet with age, yeah. Um, this is this year's growth. So the way you always, you can always tell that's this year's growth. So spruce only put on one set of growth per year. Maybe if it's in the ground, you can maybe get it out to 10 inches or so. So you can do the math real quick. It'd probably take five years before you're up to, you know, this size, height size, okay? Whereas a Colorado spruce is gonna grow twice that fast, three times. It's gonna grow 18 inches a year. So it's, it's really quickly getting up to size, like in just a couple of years, it's pretty substantial, yeah. This one has a pine cone to it, a little tiny miniature, kind of cute little pine cones, kind of cute. Um, kind of insignificant. They don't really, they're not really messy. Easy to grow, easy to grow trees, just make sure they, they drain, yeah. Yeah, so there's green, there's blue, there's silver, there's not really a white spruce. Her question was, is there a white spruce? This is probably what they're talking about, is this silver blue kind of color. So, yeah, so junipers, there'll be some other spruce. So kind of walk the, peruse the line, they'll be out there, okay. Main thing here I just wanted to show, there's dwarf varieties and there's standard size big boys. Number one seller, I didn't bring them over here, but Arizona Cypress, that's the fastest growing of all the evergreen. Well, probably Theodore Cedar is the fastest growing of all the evergreens. This is a big one. This is 80 foot tall by 25 feet wide. I mean, like next year, it's big. It's too aggressive for a lot of places. Um, I would never put one in my yard because I just don't, I don't want the kids climbing a tree that tall. And then I just don't want a tree taking up my entire landscape. I just want more than just one tree. But there is a place for it, for screening, say the barn across the way, put it right there. There's places for it. But I wouldn't line the driveway with it or, or you'll, be, you'll be limited out because it just the, the bottom branches are swooping so far out. This would be a better choice for that. Arizona cypress we plant often to cut down wind. Uh, the headlights coming into your you know, living room from the street, just dust control. Uh, we'll use that out, out in the valley areas, that southwest side, we'll try to cut back on the wind. Uh, that's because it's a fast growing, kind of juniper looking, but it's not a juniper, Arizona Cypress, uniquely Arizona, yeah. Yeah, Arizona Cypress, yeah, you could let it go by itself. So your question is, can I just, Water it for a year and let it go, yes. What I would do is I would care for it, I would fertilize it heavy, I would water it really regularly until I get it up to size. Because usually you're planting those in, in the bucket here at the garden center, they're kind of thin and wispy, they don't fill out. Most evergreens need to be in the ground for a year, they're rooting, and once they do that, the next year they just kind of go, boom, you know, what just happened? They just they just filled out. Uh, here in the bucket, they don't do it as as, as well. Um, and then I would push it to get it up to size even farther. So this is one if you want green. This is a hardy magnolia, truly hardy. It's a dwarfed southern magnolia. I've got a couple of these in my yard. They put on the big old white flowers like you're used. They smell like a magnolia. The, the leaf's a little bit smaller than your traditional one. So this, is, this is the flower. It's about to open up here in a couple of days. Uh, but just the flower will be this big around. It doesn't get quite as wide. So I've got some that are in the ground for maybe 10 years and it's gotta be 15 feet tall, maybe 12, 15 feet tall and maybe five feet wide. And I've got them behind a, a fountain, behind a wall. It's kind of, I turned them into pieces of art kind of stuff. So, but they're so pretty, they're evergreen, they're consistent, um, they're, good hardy. they're hardy, this one is. Most of the regular Southern Magnolia you buy down in Phoenix, not hardy up here. It'll freeze out. This one will, personal experience. I think this goes down to minus 10 or something. Yes, yeah, truly, truly hardy. Hardier variety. Uh, fertilize. Yeah, I do fertilize it that one pretty regularly. Anything that blooms, I'm going to fertilize more often because uh, I want the flowers. I want more. I want that reach, that just deep green. That's what I'm looking for. And that brings out the color. So, I'll do probably three, four times a year. I'll chuck a few handfuls of the all-purpose food, that 744 all-purpose food. That brings, that's all I do. 
tends to bring it back and just goes into bloom. Great little plant. Okay, that's the tree section. Did I get the rest of those? Got it? Yeah, this one. I brought this as a, because it's a top seller. And part of that game is, is it an evergreen? It's not, it's not an evergreen. But you're seeing these in bloom. It's kind of a top selling, full sun um, shrub that animals don't bother. It's so tough here that... Again, we use it in commercial landscapes because you just can't kill the thing. So it's called Potentia. Or if you're from the Midwest, middle, Midwest, Potentella. So you pronounce the L's or don't. So Potentia is how we see it in the Southwest. Comes in yellow, kind of an orangey, off orange color and an apple blossom kind of color. I find this is the most popular and this is the hardiest of the varieties. It is deciduous though. It looks evergreen, but it's deciduous. So a lot of the Californians, they want it evergreen. They want it to bloom year-round. That doesn't happen in the mountains of Arizona. It's not in a four-season climate. The potentia. The other one is like this, like that, because we'll go down that same path. This one's been in bloom for quite a while now. This is crepe myrtle. Again, it looks evergreen. If you're from the California, you'd, say, well, you'd swear that's evergreen, but it's not. It will lose its foliage in the winter. It keeps these little bean pods on there. They're kind of pretty. Um, it bothers some people. I think I, I think they look kind of neat in the, in the winter, so I keep them on there. In the spring, I'll cut them off. Uh, so I've even spray painted these kind of red. I've kind of had I have fun with plants. It's not sacrilege to kind of. They like it too. They feel all dressed up. It's like you put lipstick on them. Plants know that. They like. They respond to that. And so I'll just have fun with it. But uh, this is one that's they'll bloom, bloom, bloom. If these bother, you can cut those back and just keep it this way. But it's going to be without foliage. It'll be naked through winter. In fact, we'll start getting phone calls about the first part of May every year. I've been doing this 30 years. Every year, I think my crepe myrtle's dead. Crepe myrtle does has no interest in winter or spring. It is zero. It wants to be hot. It wants to be warm. It wants its feet to be warm. So it's waiting to wake up until it's summer. So late spring through summer and fall is when it's really famous. It's been in bloom pretty much all summer and all autumn. It'll be in bloom. Nothing's got that bright, those bright colors. Nothing's got the bright colors like a crepe myrtle. Do you have crepe myrtle trees here? So trees don't grow here. What happens is this is a zone seven, eight plant. So we're getting close to where they won't grow, but they grow. What happens is we'll go sub-zero every 10 years or so that sets them all right back to the ground. And so you'll have a tree going, huh, I proved Ken wrong. He, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And then we'll get this hard winter. It just burns it right back. And then you'll cut it off. It'll come back from the roots again. So I've had that happen. To several, I've had my crepe myrtles reset back to ground level and then grow back again. So they seem to top out kind of in this range. Uh, same with figs. Figs do the same thing. They don't, they don't grow into trees here. They grow into big shrubs is what they do, okay? So if there's a tree, there's probably better choices. They're easier to grow. Crepe myrtles and red buds are just natives. They're just better choices. Come out of there. Come on now. How big is it grow? I guess head high or so. I like mine down around butterfly bush level. I like it about this size. I just cut it. I just give it a haircut. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I've got mine in a fence. I would say don't tempt them, but if you find out, let me know. Has anyone had experience with crepe myrtles? Have they? I haven't, but my neighbors are real popular in my neighborhood. Yeah. And they, we've got deer, javelina, porch, everything. There you go. Them, and they are blooming, and they there you go. Be there you go. How tall do they get in your neighborhood? Uh, probably about five feet. Yeah, so. about this level. Yeah, different colors. I live up on the mountain near you. Yeah. So. Yep. Yep. So deer proof. There you go. That's the thing. That's mule deer. That's the big boys. Yeah, they like eating stuff. Them. Yeah. What about cattle? I haven't got any cattle there. <laughs> That's just for you. I'm going to keep poking at you. <laughs> um, uh, for the East Coast folks, boxwood, probably the number one selling evergreen um, in, in northern, probably North America. Just tough. It's green. This is all you get. It doesn't bloom, doesn't do anything romantic. It just kind of does this consistently. There's different shapes, different heights. Some of them are more spires, some of them are, some of them are, they actually create art out of them. 
But if you just want an evergreen going up to the front door, this is a great one. I'll put this into containers quite often. Put some, like, uh, these came in yesterday, the first crop of fall, fall and winter pansies. If you've got any openings in your gardens right now, put some of these in. They'll bloom January, they're in bloom. February, they're in bloom. They'll just keep on blooming. So it's a great little winter plant that we grow pansies like no one else does in the country. Oh, they love them. Yeah, they love these. Yeah. But you put those together in a pot by the front door and you got something to look at when everything else is wintry and dead. This kind of gives you go, oh, look, I'm blooming just for you and I feel special. So um, boxwood, pansies, herbs, rosemary. This is one that I brought this as a, um, just be careful. So we've got so much influence from Phoenix that there's a lot of varieties that grow down there and they don't grow up here. So, so rosemary is not just rosemary. There's probably 50 different kinds. So you want to get the ones that are hardier. They got more antifreeze in them so they don't freeze out in the winter. That's especially true for ground cover varieties. So the, the carpet varieties or spreading ones. Um, this is a, a Tuscan blue. This gets into a shrub about like this, kind of upright. Blue flowers typically blooms twice a year in the spring and again in the fall. Um, just a great little evergreen and, and you can cook with it. You can use it on the barbecue. You can, uh, or just have it as a shrub out there looking good. It's a great little plant. Um, ARP, Huntington Carpet, and there's one other. Basically, just buy it from Waters Garden Center. You'll be okay. You'll be safe. So we don't carry any of the varieties that, that freeze out. Truly, I mean, I'm embarrassed. Sometimes I go over to the box store, the big blue ones. You don't want to shop there. Uh, they, I'm just embarrassed going, oh, they're selling that. I can't believe it. It's a Phoenix buyer just said, send 50 of those to all my stores. And they don't care. They just want to sell you a plant. So it's warrantied, though. Okay, so Tuscan blue. Uh, lavenders, evergreens again. So I brought this one because it's blonde ambition. Is that right? No, platinum blonde, sorry. So it gets that blue flower to it. It gets about this tall, kind of ball shaped. Blue flowers on it. Um, this one I find people overwater it too much. So if you're going to plant lavender, abuse it, kick dirt at it, curse at it. Whatever you do, don't water it too much. Maybe once or twice a week, and that's good. I grow mine in containers, and they love that drainage that happens with containers. Raise beds. Out there in the yard, be really careful not to over, overdo it with water. This is the time of year when they tend to stress out and die. Is that the only style of lavender that does grow there? Oh, no, I've got several. I just brought one because everyone knows what lavender is, but no one's seen this one because I'm the only one that grows it. So it's just... Platinum blonde. It's a gold colored with a blue flower. I've got the standard blue foliage too. Okay. Go a couple more and then we'll go over how to, no, we'll go two more here. And I got a couple shade ones and we'll go over how to plant and then we'll, then we'll wrap this thing up because we're getting into almost an hour. Seats are starting to get hard at home. I don't want you going to the refrigerator. Don't go anywhere. Stay right there. Um, this is golden euonymus. I thought I'd better bring two of these. Let's see. No. Yeah. Two. These are related here. Just different colors of gold. Euonymus does really, really well here. It's got a waxy leaf, with, which makes it very efficient with a dry climate. It really likes green. These are both big. They'll get it head high pretty easy. We'll use these as, as hedges pretty consistently. Fills in fast. Pretty white flower. Um, deer do like this. Rabbits really like this. So kind of be careful of those two things. Otherwise, you're better off doing the, the um, Eliagnus, the, the silverberry. They don't eat that. Or the Cotoneasters, they don't eat those. That's one. If in doubt, ask us. We kind of, we deal with enough customers all over the county. They're coming from Cornville and Sedona and Seligman's on the map anymore. It's just, we've grown up so much that people are coming from everywhere. And so now we just started, we're now starting to have customers come in from like Phoenix because we're carrying rare and exotic uh, house plants you can't find anywhere. Like you can't find them anywhere in the state, in the Southwest, we're the only ones. We got relationships and so people are going, whoa, that's from there. these are really nerdy house plant people. Like they see something freaky, unusual, and they're going, I'm traveling. The days in Prescott just could get my little $100 house plant. Whoa, cool. very cool, I like it. 
trying to cater to gardeners. This is, um, is this Tuscan or Sienna? Tuscan flame, heavenly bamboo, or Nandina. You'll hear them by both names. California calls it heavenly bamboo. The rest of the country, the normal folks, we call it Nandina. So this is an evergreen. Truly, it doesn't look evergreen, but it's, it's and it doesn't look like, 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 looks like animals would love it. They don't bother this for some reason. It's got a sap to it that's real milky. I think that's what's, what's going on. It's tainted its flavor where animals are not attracted to this. Gets a little red berry, kind of white flowers on top, but just a nice consistent. This one's kind of a, unusual um, in that it's got a brighter red to it. And if it's in, out in the sunshine, late fall through winter, it turns this bright, bright red. So it's not evergreen. It's, it holds its foliage, but it turns this red to green, has this different color to it. So. Now, what about fertilizing? Because I had some in California, and some did great, and others did Yeah. Die. So what about fertilizing? So they'll do better here than they do in California. They like the dry and the brightness. They really seem to thrive in that. They probably won't grow as fast or as tall as you're used to, but they'll be a deeper, richer color. And they'll bloom better, and their brightness will be much better because uh, of that, the altitude. It just really makes them shine through the winter. You're going to fertilize minimum three times a year here. Three times, spring, summer, and fall, minimum. And what you're doing is you're trying to compensate for the water and our alkalinity. First of all, you have no nutrients in your yard at all. Have you tried to dig a hole in your yard yet? There's nothing there. There's not one benefit. There's not one worm. There's nothing there. And there's no food. So this, you're, you're going to have to fertilize. You're going to have to supplement that a little more often. Um, and I'm a strong advocate of, of organics. So I, I think we can do this better than just jump on a bunch of chemicals on there. It's better for your worms. It's better for your yard. Better for your pets. Better for your, it's just better. Uh, it's better for you mainly. Uh, so this is this, just use this three times a year. If you're thinking holidays, think um, Easter, 4th of July, because it's always going to rain. So the rains always start 4th of July sometime. We never know how much it's going to rain, but it always, the humidity goes up. We always get some more rain. Take advantage of that. And the most important feeding of the entire year, for, especially for the spring bloomers, bar none is October, Halloween. You'll see the mums in bloom. The aspens have turned gold. They're starting to drop some leaves. That's your cue. Fertilize everything in the yard. Just fertilize everything with this. It's granular form. Don't focus on the trunk. Focus on the outer drip line, the branches. And because it's organic, it'll break down real slowly over the next three months or so. Um, it'll just your plants will do better. And, and we know that this is made for here. We know your water is super alkaline. So we're trying to add sulfur. We're trying to we're trying to counteract your water because we all deal with the same water, same soil. We're trying to bring that pH down so the fertilizer acts better, greens, greens things up better. Just you're going to get better. That's how you'll keep things going. So now you've got a, how to fertilize here. That's a bonus for today. couple shade plants because some of you have shade, and I just have three. Holly does exceptionally well here. I've got several different varieties. It does have the ones with the red berries for the holidays. This is holly. It does evergreen, but it does not like more than six hours of sun. It likes to be more, more shaded area. Uh, ivy. It says, you read the tag, grows in full sun. Not here. It'll like more shade. It'll take a lot of bright sun. Doesn't like that full day sun. This can be a weed, so you got to be careful with this. Or what I do, I'm really aggressive with it. Again, this is a gardener's plant. It likes to be touched and nurtured, and it likes to be trimmed and it wants you to talk to it and then it just grows more the more you interact with this plant the more it grows and just i grow this in, in containers like on structures like i've got pom-pom structures and i keep the the ivy looking like pom-pom at the front door and we put little lights in it the birds like the nest in the middle of it that's how i use this the last one i grow i have this one this is uh you Oops. If you see tags like this, these are, these are the spring and summer things. There's nothing wrong with this plant. We just took 20 bucks off of it because we just don't want it anymore. We want you to have it. Clear it out of here. So there's some. this is, means the bargain and the price will be right there. 
So as you walk through, not everything, like some of this stuff, like this just came off the truck today. We're trying to replace these with uh, the newer, newer stuff. Get back on there. I'll deal with that later. This is, uh, so I've got a two story, two and a half story house. It's classic, cut in the mountainside. You know, the basement's down here. You're living on that top floor. You're walking down several flights of steps to get to the backyard. I've got this stucco wall that's just hideous. No windows. It looks like it needs like prison bars on it or something. It's just, it's, it's ugly looking. So I needed something to soften this up. It's from the basement door. So I put two of these, this is, this is a long wall. It's probably 15 feet wide. I put two of these Hicks U's because it's north facing. It never sees the sun there. What am I gonna do? I need an evergreen to look good. So I put a piece of art right in the middle of it, framed it with either side of the uh, um, of these U's. These are now up to 15 feet tall. They're, they're up to, not the eaves, but obviously you're not looking at this stark wall. You're looking at the art and the green, and it feels like a garden. That's what I wanted. And so that's how you use this kind of plant. Um, it is on the same irrigation as my native stuff. So it gets watered maybe once every 10 days or so, but it's the north facing. It doesn't get the heat, it doesn't dry out. So I think it's okay that those shade lover plant, they, they don't need as much water as we think that they need because they're not exposed. The, this ground is not being sunburned all the time. That's, that's that south facing that just sunburns. It gets so hot over there, So, but use. This gets, uh, I don't know, probably to the moon. I'll probably start topping it. I'll probably need a ladder to top it. Uh, and then they're about this wide like that. They grow in a column kind of thing. There's a spreading variety too, but look, true, in the shade, no more than maybe four or five hours of sun on that. Keep in the shade. It will not like the sun here, okay? How to plant. Let's plant this. Again, this is juniper. This is Calgary carpet. This is as tall as it gets, but it spreads like this. So I've got quite a few rentals around the town. So I make money with this. I go buy a rental. I've got employees that live in them. It just employers have to provide housing anymore because you can't afford to work in a retail shop and, and, and live here. So we're having to get creative with some of this stuff. This is what I put in those rentals because you can't kill it. You can run this over with a truck. It would still grow. And it looks really, that's pretty next to a rock lawn. And you just want to soften up the edge of the lawn, or the rock, uh, the rock yard. This spreads out, just gets out about six, eight feet. Really, really neat, clean, great for erosion control. The hill's starting to slough off because of all the rain. This is a really good plant for that. For what? No, for uh, irrigation control. So, so flooding, that kind of stuff. Let's pick this one, yet yeah, erosion. Let's pick this one because it's easy to see. This is super drought hardy. If you're gonna kill this, it'll be from ground that does not perk, stays too soggy. It, it'll literally drown to death. Manzanita, all these native stuff I just mentioned. If you're gonna kill them, it'll be from overwatering. Whatever you do, disconnect from garden information from Phoenix. Whatever they say, do the opposite. Uh, they're telling you for Phoenix. So what they say down there is you plant your plant your plant in a divot. You know, have a four inch hole so you can rain harvest and and so you can keep things moist or easier to water. If you do that up here, you're going to die, and it's going to happen in March or now during the wet because March is a real wet uh, um, snow. It's that wet, heavy snow happens in March. And then now we get quite a bit of rain, typically in the evening. And so things stay too wet. Here you want to have everything at ground level when you're all done, or even on a slight mound. I plant my things on a very slight mound. Um, it guarantees that at least if I leave this much of the root out of the ground, and then I mound some soil up to that, so it's just a real slight, just feathered out, um, it guarantees at least, no matter how wet it gets, at least that much of the roots can breathe. This is really important for evergreens. All the ones we've mentioned, if it's an evergreen, they're more prone to have root rot, root damage, from over, over, over watering, more so than a leafy thing, like your crepe myrtles, the lilacs, Rosa Sharon's. These things that are, that are more deciduous, they lose their leaves in the winter, 
They can die too, but they're less, they're, they're, they can tolerate it more. So what I'll do is I'll dig my hole the same depth as the bucket, add a bucket on either side, saucer shaped, kind of all that dirt that you have out on the side, in your wheelbarrow and your tarp, whatever it is, filter out that soil, anything bigger than a golf ball, get rid of it. It's just gonna heat up in summer. It can't, it can't hold water molecules very well. So you wanna screen that stuff out of there. Uh, so if you want smaller particles. You're gonna blend that soil that's left over with about 25% mulch. This is compost for you folks in the Midwest. You know, mulch for you all is like bark. Right? Not, we use the word bark here for bark. Here, mulch is that composted chocolate mocha uh, mulch. Yeah, kind of. This is made to add to our ground to soften up the soil so it doesn't compact right back down. So it's going to keep that native soil from, if you just dig it out, it looks so fluffy, you water it one time, it goes right back to its natural state, solid clay. This is really important for that 69 corridor, that backside, Paquito Valley, Cody Springs, hard clay out there. You need to keep that soil from compacting back down. So this keeps it lighter so the roots can go through it. Okay. So you're going to take about 25% or, or one shovel's mulch to three shovels worth of, of, of native soil. You can cheat it up to about 50-50. After that, this gets too, this gets too, too soggy, stays too wet. So there you want to, instead, if you hit a big rock or some big boulder, you dig that thing out of the way, you need actually more filler, you get some topsoil or something. So, but most of us aren't going to get that. Most of us are going to have soil, blend it with this, backfill it, pack it down around the root ball. Um, let's show you how to deal with the roots. Ooh, this is perfect. See this white stuff here? Those are mycorrhizal colonies. So already the beneficial things are attaching themselves to the roots and they'll start to elongate and go out in the surrounding soil. That's a real bonus. We actually front load our, all of our plants. We put mycorrhizal additives. So all of our plants come with that from tomatoes, whatever, because it's so beneficial. And we know that you don't have any in your yard. So we're trying to help you populate those colonies fast. Kind of an insider scoop on why our plants live and others might not. But this, you're seeing lots of new roots. Here, I would just rough this up like this. Just kind of don't, don't go crazy with it. Some folks will say, oh, just beat it up till no soil is left. Don't do that. It's hard on it. The main thing is at the bottom, I'll try to open it up a little bit. Or sometimes, if I see, that's about right. That feels good. Can you see the root hair is now starting to kind of feather out? Now you're perfectly, you're ready to start planting that in the ground. If it's really, let's say it's a real big sycamore or a uh, large cottonwood, sometimes you have really fast growing, thick, aggressive roots. There I'll just score it like this with my pruners or a knife. And then that's enough to root prune it. So now the new root hair will start coming out sideways in the surrounding soil. Then backfill around that, that soil. The other thing is the top of this root ball should never be buried. Always keep it exposed. Don't Leave, let this breathe. See, a lot of folks go, dirt can go up here and, and more dirt's even better and they'll bury the trunk like this. That causes crown rot. So just some rookie mistakes I don't want my friends to go into. I want you not to, to do that. But keep this exposed and don't let dirt pile up on the trunk for trees, uh, for berries, um, just on anything. Just leave this exposed. It'll help you. you Hold on, I'm not done. Okay. Hold on. When I'm all done, I'll take a handful of this all-purpose food, and I'll sprinkle that on top of the root ball. Again, I'm trying to launch for the next three months. It gives it some food, something to feed off of, so I can get new roots and new top growth coming off of it. When I'm all done, I'll water it in with root and grow. Did I bring some of that? Yeah. This is a compost tea that we make. We actually brew steam tea. When you open it up, it looks like molasses. It looks like fish emulsion without all the stink, uh, but, it, but plants really respond. So it's this, they'll go into shock when you do that. So you, you water this in uh, when you're all done with root and grow added to your water. And I'll do that about every two weeks, I'll give it this uh, until I see the plant stabilize. So, you know, you're going, oh, it's starting to put new leaves, new growth is coming out, and then I'll, it doesn't need this anymore. The fertilizer is gonna take it from there. And that's how you plant. You, again, you'll have that handout very quickly 
in your in your inbox here shortly. So okay. So did that card did that uh, clipboard get taken around? So make sure you, you you get your name on that if you want that. Now I have time for a question. Yes. Yeah. And it's been this way since early July. So we have discovered that everything is rocked. They have to bring in a giant jackhammer yep. to dig it out. And what's not rocked is clay. Yep. The good news is where most of our plantings are going to be, they're bringing in actual filter. Good. Painting walls good. And stuff like that. Then I'm going to have artificial turf, but I'm going to have one inch rock. Good question, actually. So her question is, she's going to get a new landscape coming in. She's going to put rock down. She's going to plant in, she's going to have plants in, in the rock and some astroturf. Um, that's, that's a classic look. Um, that extra rock, so you're using one inch or three quarter inch minus, pretty standard. Do I bring that right up to the trunk or do I leave it out here? For me, I leave it out. I think it looks unnatural to have rock going, have trees coming right out of the rock. That doesn't quite look natural. I'd rather see, I'll take decorative rock or I'll take, I'll just try to make around an area underneath that. I like shredded bark or more mulch or something. It looks natural or more natural. I even put under plantings on mine. Sometimes I'll put hookahs and things underneath. So it looks like my plants are coming up out of life, like life is erupting, not isolated in, in my rock. So, and you'll know that when you get it in, you go, oh, that's, Ken was right. That rock going right up against, that looks a little off. There's something, you can't, you can't describe it, but you can feel it. it just it doesn't quite look right. But then you start modifying. It's called gardening. You'll get it. Um, <laughs> um, another little trick, and then I'll leave you with this. How are we doing? So um, your spruce, junipers, uh, hydrangeas, uh, hollies, things that like real acid, or they like a lot of color coming out. Um, aluminum sulfate is what you give them. This is an extra mineral that can bring. So, so you'll plant a Colorado spruce. Here you go, folks online. Thanks again, appreciate that. So this is not a fertilizer, it's a mineral you're adding. It lowers that peach, makes it very acidic. And then it's actually aluminum. The plants are actually taking this plant here. This is actually aluminum. It's picking up aluminum out, out, of the, out, of the, out of the yard, and then you can actually wipe this off. You take your fingers, it'll actually turn green. It's actually secretion to it, so it's a covering. So on the inside of a tree is always greener than the outside new growth. Well, if it runs out of those minerals, aluminum sulfate, as it grows, over two, three, four years, it'll just go back to green. Maybe that's what you want out there. Just I want it to be more green. No aluminum sulfate for you, go green. Uh, but most folks are planting this for that silvery blue color to it. So you bring that out just by adding once a year or so, handful of aluminum sulfate, and it brings that color right back. So pretty common when we get people going, it looked so good three years ago, and now it doesn't. Aluminum sulfate. That's kind of the insider scoop for you. Spruce, the things that are silver color, this kind of this uh, kind of Arizona blue colors, they seem to benefit from it. The other one are going to be your... Uh, um, hydrangeas, uh, uh, hollies, they're famous for that. So, okay, with that, I have room for two more questions, then we're out. Or no more questions. Good. It's been a good class. Yeah. Your, um, the, I, I don't, the purple tree under. Purple leaf plum? Yeah. Or robinia? Okay, purple leaf plum. Yeah, I wouldn't do that with aluminum sulfate now. It's, they, they would benefit from the all-purpose, wherever that went, that all-purpose food. That, just do that three times a year, spring, summer, fall, Easter, 4th of July, Halloween, and you're good to go. So that'll be enough. You'll get bright pink flowers. you get more and brighter pinker flowers in spring, a deeper, richer purple coming out of the foliage. It'll really be striking. Yeah. Uh-huh. So are pampas grass evergreen? That's actually a good question. No. Uh, no, they go brown. They go brown in the winter. Really what you do with my pampas grass, I cut it right back to the ground every spring, every late winter, like March sometime. 
I'll whack it right down. You look about knee high, you've got this curly Q kind of under undergrowth. I'll cut it back to that, fertilize it with the all-purpose plant food. And now you've got thick new green foliage coming out. You get better plumes that way. If you don't do that, it will grow by itself. And a lot of folks let them go, but then you get this brown foliage with the green foliage. It doesn't look as vibrant as if you were to cut it back. Yeah. Cows on pampas grass. I would think they would leave it alone. I've seen them on... It's sharp. Yeah, it's sharp. I would think they'd be okay, but again, I'm not a cow expert. What I would do is I would put a test victim out first to see how it does and then commit to the entire driveway. <laughs> okay. Yeah, last one. Yeah. No, it's going to benefit, especially the dwarf ones, probably Colorado spruce you could, or with far less. I think you could keep easily water that maybe once a week. That'd be more than enough. In June, it's 100 degrees. There's no humidity. Probably once a week is fine. And then now you could probably back it off altogether. So, but I would care for it just to keep it healthy looking. Uh, what, what the problem with your evergreens, the trees, is once they stress out, they look alive, look alive, look alive, then they get stressed. One brown, just one little brown branch, and all of a sudden the entire, all the needles drop like all at once. Boom. It died two months ago. You didn't notice it till all of a sudden. And once it, once you get even a little bit of damage, there's no recovery. So, well, there is recovery. Come over to Waters Garden Center. I'll sell you a brand new one because that's the only thing you're gonna. That's the only way to get past it. So you kind of want to care. That's why I started out. Really take advantage of this weather for your native plants because there's an opportunity now to keep them healthier than you could otherwise. They've been stressed for the last few years. Nope, I got to cut off. We can go all day. Sorry. I will hang out here until you're done with all your questions. I'm not going. Take a look at the plants. Uh, be careful of the cactus. Now I'll just be here answering questions, so I don't want to cut you out too much. But before I let you go, the old actor in me just says, "You got to clap for me because I just feel better about myself and others." And I appreciate your coming. Next week is uh, gardening for newcomers. That's one for you newer folks. It's real. It's more technical, frost dates, zones, all that kind of stuff. Lots of handouts on technical stuff. Less plants, more. Here's what. Here's when you really do things, uh, which will help you not kill things because of frost dates and stuff. So we'll look at that one for next week. Appreciate it, you all. Plants right now. Um, it's probably